Hello, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining. Welcome to the second fireside chat of the Vercel AI Accelerator program. Uh, today, we're going to have Joseph Nelson of RoboFlow talk to us about building and deploying computer vision products. I'm especially excited uh, for this one because it's actually quite a applicable to a few of the companies we have in our accelerator. For example, we have um, Include Health, who are building a remote physical therapy tool to extend physical care to homes. And so they're actually kind of tracking people's movements and joint movements and all of that kind of stuff. So there's some computer vision uh, happening there. And um uh, Log Meals as well uh, is is doing some cool stuff in this space where they're they're taking pictures of food and you can actually that they're trying to determine how many calories exist in that food. Uh, so there's some cool um, computer vision uh, products that people are already working on. I'm looking forward to to a great session here. Uh, for some quick background on Joseph, Joseph is the co-founder and CEO at RoboFlow, which makes tools that over 250,000 developers use uh, to kind of build products on uh, with computer vision. So RoboFlow, it's backed by YC, Craft Ventures, uh, the founders of OpenAI, and, and a bunch of other people. He also, Joseph also uh, co-founded and sold an NLP company uh, previously that sorted the U.S. Congress as mail. And uh, he he also worked at Facebook before he learned to code writing programs for TI-84 calculators. And he is uh, Joseph of Iowa on Twitter. So like I said, we're going to be talking about computer vision today, uh, which uh, essentially enables your app to turn videos and images into real actions. And so he's going to go over how to build uh, these computer vision powered applications that leverage APIs and real time kind of client side browser models, uh, drone image processing to, to basically uh, for, for a lot of different use cases. So we're actually going to do a choose your own adventure uh, where Joseph will be presenting a couple of choices and, and we're going to deep dive into one of them. So without further ado. Please take it away, Joseph. Thanks for being thanks here. So much. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. Hey, everybody, excited to be here. Uh, as Hassan mentioned, I'll aim to make today as interactive as possible. Um, I've got a few different examples, but ultimately you can guide the way of what's going to be most interesting to, to dive into. Uh, I'll share my screen and walk through some slides and give some context into all things computer vision. That looks like it's successful. All right. So my goal here today is to probably show you both ways you can use computer vision that you might already know of and expose you of ways that you may not realize that you can use computer vision in your apps and services. Um, computer vision's come a long way uh, and it means that your app or product can probably see as well or better than you can. So today I'm gonna show you how to use computer vision to turn images and videos into actions. First things first though, I kind of wanna give like a, a why, like why would you use computer vision? Where does this fit in? Uh, how does this all kind of come together? The North Star of why we work on computer vision tools and why I'm personally so bullish on it is, in a sense, computer vision enables anything we see or things that, you know, maybe humans are not able to be present to see, either underwater or in outer space or any part of the universe, to become programmable. And if something can be seen and it can be turned into some digital representation, then you can write software for it. And if you can write software for it, of course, you can make it be more engaging, more interactive, uh, more fulfilling, all of these things. So we kind of say that our mission is to make the world programmable, uh, maybe the universe, um, because computer vision is sort of the core missing element. And even if, even if you already have software, like even if you already have something that is um, turned into bits already, computer vision can enable you to deliver magical experiences for your end users. Um, so to give you some examples of some fun ones that I think are particularly goofy that some of our users have, have built in this populace of 250,000 people of all these sorts of open source projects, I thought I'd start with a bunch of those types of examples to inspire and delight. So first things first, um, we have Dave. Dave made a flamethrowing weed killing robot. Uh, so he used a computer vision model to identify weeds in his yard. Um, and Hackaday kind of wrote this article about it. Um, and uh, you know, kind of titled "Don't Sleep in the Yard." And actually, I actually time snapped the uh, YouTube video here. Let's see if I can click it to showing a oh, classic. <laughs> Wait, can I enjoy this app? To actually seeing it in action. It's a pretty comprehensive project. Um, and believe it or not, there's actually been not one but two flamethrowing, weed killing robots built with RoboFlow. So it's a it's a pretty big tan, I think. 
Um, another thing that has been built with RoboFlow is uh, during COVID, um, this is actually the same guy. He's just like a prolific hacker. He made a uh, exercise machine for his cat. So the thesis here is he took a laser pointer, he taped it to a robotic arm, he taught his robotic arm to recognize his cat, and then he has the laser pointer consistently point um, uh, 10 feet away uh, from the cat. So I kind of snipped this one to uh, a relevant portion of the video. You can see the uh, <laughs> laser pointer around. I asked him about it. He said, you know, he thought maybe his cat was uh, putting on too much weight during COVID. So this was this was his solution. But maybe you're like, okay, I don't like robotics. You know, robotics is, you know, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of moving parts and pieces. I don't blame you. Maybe you like drones. Um, so here's a project where um, uh, some users have gone through and made a georeferencing project. And then we actually adapted it and open source an example on the RoboFlow repository. So basically what this is, is you can take a, a um, the footage from a DJI drone, um, you download that footage, you upload the flight log, and then wherever your drone flew with a custom model loaded, it'll put point, points on the map for the object of interest that it saw. So for, for this example, it's finding all solar panels and it's showing you where on the drone's flight path it saw those solar panels. Um, so the custom model here is a model that finds solar panels on roofs and runs on the drone's flight path. It's pretty cool. Um, you can also control OBS with uh, computer vision. This is sort of a fun thing that we've done internally of you know changing different dimensions, angles, um, Hassan, you seem like a good, uh, you, you invest a lot in your setup. You could have something show if you put two hands up, a bunch of Vercel logos pop up or something like this. Uh, we just moved into a new office this week, hence like the, the giant white space, but pretty soon I'll have my studio back up and running. Um, another thing, use case that uh, we kind of did this one for April Fools last year is we saved the world from, uh, from Rickroll um, using computer vision. So what this does is it actually combines the prior example of OBS and uh, everything that your browser sees, it streams and runs through a local server. And then whenever it sees Rick Astley's face, it blocks it out and then mutes your, uh, mutes your computer. And if you didn't think I wasn't going to do a live demo, so I had the chance to rickroll all of you, you are wrong. So for example, the way that this model works is uh, it looks for anywhere that it sees Rick Astley's face. Um, and here I'll actually just open up the webcam model and this will access my webcam. And sure enough, while testing this, don't worry, I had to recall myself plenty of times. But uh, you can kind of see there. Here, let me turn the uh, confidence and see the labels. So there it says that's Rick, identifies where Rick is, and that's not Rick. Some groundbreaking stuff. Um, now, obviously, with this, with this model, the model just identifies Rick, not Rick, and then you pass that to uh, a second set of logic that does what you want it to do. Another example, series of examples that we've seen is um, in augmented reality. And this is actually how RoboFlow got its start is building augmented reality apps. So here, for example, the model runs fully on device and this is a Sudoku solver. It sees the puzzle, sees the board and fills in all the results. Um, and you know, we actually built this before RoboFlow was a company in 2017 with augmented reality kit and it won product on AR app of the year, um, which is also the same year that uh, Tesla won for the Model 3. So we joke we share an award with, with Elon. But you can see the cool example of case in this example is the model runs fully locally, identifies puzzles and fills in results. Um, so it's kind of a neat one. Um, more relevant for, for the web and internet native products is um, perhaps you're familiar with CLIP, Contrastive Language Image for Training, an open AI model that came out in 2021. This is one of the places where I'll do a deeper dive. Um, and uh, when CLIP came out in 2021, we were really curious of how capable and powerful it was. And so we actually built this thing, uh, which became, I think, the largest AI uh, art competition on the internet. Um, and basically what this was is, I have an example here. It was like a Microsoft Paint-like interface. And if we have time at the end, we can all play a game together. But once you draw like in this, in this browser, and you know, this one's like drawn angry cow, so I'm just gonna do this and I hit submit. What this does is it hits a CLIP embedded endpoint and then scores how similar my drawing was to the prompt. So Clip embeds both the feature space of embedding drawn angry cow, and then it embedded my really poorly drawn, not so angry cow. And it saw the ranking of how similar was my embedded image of the angry cow similar to the text. Now, of course, this is a game, but you could use the same thing for filtering, right? You can do it for NSFW filtering, content filtering, image search, retrieval, semantic search. So this is a place where we can do a bit of a, a, a bit of a deeper dive here in a second. Um, the point is over 250,000 developers have made all sorts of things from gas lit detectors, plant versus weed detectors, hard hat detection, satellite imagery, ways of playing tennis, uh, pickleball, all these sorts of things with computer vision. So the goal here is to give you the inspiration to see different ways that you might be able to use computer vision in your app or service.
So point is computer vision, it's useful. Let's dive into how to do it. So uh, with that in mind of here's some fun use cases, some obvious use cases, we've inspired the hackers. Let's talk about some more practical ones and actually how we go about building computer vision use cases. So ultimately all computer vision, um, you're gonna get to a point where you have a model and you wanna use that model. You wanna deploy that model and consume that model in your app or service, right? So we ultimately wanna to get to the furthest right portion here where we have a deploy model that we can use. In some use cases, there's a model that we can use as is. Like an example of the Clip semantic search engine, we could just use Clip as is. No training, no separate data set, just use the Clip endpoint and use what it does to know um, and embed images and embed text. Now, in some cases, um, large foundation models, and we'll talk about some of the foundation models and their capabilities, fall short. Um, there might be a case where the problem that you're solving needs to, for example, run on maybe data that's not as generally available. Um, maybe you have proprietary data that is unique to your app. Or maybe you want to mix in proprietary data and you want to get finer tuned, higher quality results. Uh, in the LLMs world, we actually see increasingly that there might be a trend towards doing really, really fine-tuned domain-specific models outperforming even um, you know, the GPT-4s of the world, which I think is um, going to be increasingly a trend of distillation. I think also there's cases where perhaps you have um, a model that you can't call an external service. Maybe you can't call an API, or maybe you're compute constrained. Maybe you, an example of the Magic Sudoku app that I, saw, that I showed, that one runs at 60 FPS on an iPhone. We can't yet get foundation vision models to run at that level of, of throughput on an edge device, which means you're going to need a smaller, faster, task-specific model architecture to solve your given problem. So those are some cases where you may need to uh, train your own model. That doesn't mean we can't use foundation vision models to make it faster, um, but we may need to create our own specific architecture. Or in some cases, maybe we just have data that you know the broader world has never seen before. I kind of think about the evolution of, of multimodality, open flamingo, GPT vision, a lot of these capabilities as you know, your classic bell curve and you have a normal distribution. In the center of that normal distribution, you have the most commonly seen known things. You know, historically, this has been known as the common objects and context data set, COCO, where you have things like person, chair, fork, um, bus, uh, vehicle, um, they actually call it sports ball, <laughs> all these sorts of things. So common objects that you see uh, out in the world. Now that's like the exact center of the bell curve. Now large foundation models kind of expand that bell curve outward. Perhaps you've seen the segment anything model, which can see any sort of object and create a really rich mask around it. Um, you can think about some problems that are in the long, and then if we think about the long tails, the problems that exist in the long tails are ones that are like the proprietary data problems or problems where you need some sort of unique insight. Now, over time, large models and foundation models are certainly going to spread outward into those, those, those tails over time. Um, but there may be, again, cases where you have proprietary data or your deployment constraints require that you train your own data. Uh, and so that's where, of course, you're going to need both your own data set, you're going to need a model, and you're going to be able to deploy that model. Even if you're deploying a foundation model, you also need to observe and ensure that that model is doing what you expect it to do. Is clip filtering things correctly for you? Is it retrieving good search results for your end users? All these are sorts of questions that relate to model observability and mean that you want to do things for everything from collecting the data set to training your model to deploying that model. So with that in mind, uh, I want to talk through three scenarios. And then as Hassan mentioned, it will kind of choose your own adventure and go deeper into uh, some of these scenarios. So let's do the first scenario. Scenario one, we have a model that works as is, meaning there's a large foundation model that delivers the results that we need to use for our task or problem. So I'm going to work from left to right on this slide. Foundation models that might meet this requirement are things like OpenAI's Clip or Facebook's Segment Anything model, Grounding Dino, Salesforce's Blip2, um, um, Docker, which is a uh, uh, document uh, object recognition and um, OCR model. Maybe BARD, multimodality with BARD will get there. Um, GPT Vision seems pretty promising. Open Flamingo. These are some of the foundation models. Now, common uses. When we think about common uses, you know, this kind of has to be a little bit tautological. Definitionally, we're doing something that is generally uh, known and available because then it would show up in the training set for these large models. So maybe we're, you know, countering and filtering of known objects of like, you know, just dog or cat is kind of a classic example. Maybe we're capturing video, captioning images or videos and news articles. Maybe we're doing general image uh, question and answer, 
or maybe we're counting like given known objects. Now, some of the assumptions that we're making is, um, of course, that you know the large foundation model sufficiently knows about the problem that we're tackling. We're making that assumption. Um, so in other words, we're assuming the foundation model has awareness of our domain problem. The second assumption we're making if we're deploying this way is that we have access to large compute, which usually means internet, because we would be just be making a request to a data center with you know, AWS or something like this, where we have um, constantly spinning GPUs. Typically, this also means we don't have real-time requirements because you know we're maybe, maybe waiting at best 150 milliseconds, at worst, maybe 300 or 500 milliseconds for a response, which that latency might be too high for some of our use cases. Um, and we're also making an assumption that we don't need to own any of the data or end model IP. Uh, it's not important for the purposes of our business logic to innovate on that part of the stack. So we're saying it's okay to just use a large foundation model as this, right? So this is kind of scenario one. Scenario one is I have some problem, a foundation model works to solve that problem, and I want to deploy and use that model as is. An example of this is like semantic search. So in semantic search, uh, I kind of mentioned that uh, Clip is a good example. And here, I think this is going to be pretty relevant for most folks that are building in this cohort. So I actually went ahead and um, I, let's see, I pulled this one up for, for handy. I, uh, here. I published it on the blog this afternoon because I knew I was giving this talk. Okay. So uh, this one is a, an example where we're going to use the um, Clip uh, hosted on the Rebelflow API to, do in, to embed an image um, and then store the embeddings of that image uh, in a database. In this case, we're going to use Superbase and use, make use of PG Vector to store those embeddings. And then later, we're going to query those embeddings. And we're going to say which of those embeddings are most similar to some text query. Um, this is very similar, actually, to the silly paint.wtf game I showed a bit ago, where I drew like a sad cow or a mad cow or whatever it was. Um, where we're taking all these images, we're getting the clip embedding for them, we're storing that clip embedding in PG vector, and then we're taking some text embedding and we're comparing the cosine similarity of how similar these image embeddings and the query embeddings are. And the way that this one's set up is the user sets a match, match threshold, which means if I'm querying my database, I could say my match threshold is 10. I want the top N images that most correspond to the text query that I'm making. Um, so that's that's an example of, of you know, uh, a large model that knows a lot about a lot and can probably be used out of the box to do some problems that I want to tackle. Um, those problems, again, could be things like semantic search. And when, I, when we say semantic search, we mean that um, we're not just doing rule-based, attribute-based search of images. Like we can do free-form search. Actually, this is exactly how we power RoboFlow Universe. Um, RoboFlow Universe is a collection of 200,000 open source projects that users have created of all sorts of projects. So for example, I can do free-form text search like sharks from aerial imagery. And this, this search is going to look for the contents of the images that most meet my query. Um, so here I see this, this open source project that a user worked on. And if I look at the images in the data set, sure enough, they <laughs> kind of scary. They meet that, that query of, um, you know, my free form search query. And uh, this is all powered by Clip. And um, we basically open source the infrastructure that we use to run this search and now offer it as an endpoint. So that's, that's a use case here, like semantic, uh, semantic search. Um, and it's super robust because at RoboFlow, we add about 500 gigabytes every single day. Everything gets indexed and it's searchable. And you kind of saw how fast the query times were. So it's, it's, it works pretty well. Um, okay, now um, scenario two. Scenario two is we think we have a model that works as is. So we have some tasks that we want to solve, right? We have some computer vision tasks that we want to solve. And we think a model exists that allows us to solve that task already. Um, this might be something like, you know, um, I think that one of the examples I put in on the next slide is like species identification. Um, uh, like, for example, uh, if I want to, I'm, I'm an environmentalist and I want to count the number of species that are entering or leaving. Uh, a given portion of a uh, conservation area. Um, you know, initially it might just be sufficient to say, I want to see, you know, birds. And Clip probably does a great job of knowing birds. Clip probably even knows the difference between bald eagles and cardinals and robins and these sorts of things. But at some point, maybe as a naturalist, you need to get more specific than what Clip knows, or maybe Clip starts to falter. Or maybe the, the angle of where your camera is positioned 
is just slightly different than the images that Cliff was aware of. And so the point is you found yourself in a position where this foundation model, which is incredibly powerful, starts to fall short in some places, not everywhere, but like just enough where you know you can eke out a bit more performance if you use some of your own data. So a lot of the times, I think a lot of people think they're in scenario one, but they're actually in scenario two, where they're like, yep, the large foundation model will work out of the box. And then in reality, you'll find that um, the performance fails in some, some places. Um, and so I have here, um, you know, the foundation models I've listed are relatively similar. The uses are relatively similar, except I, I, I kind of cheated and said things that are less generally known. I mean, the heuristic for generally known is something that gets to domain expertise or, like I mentioned, novel lighting, novel angles, things like this. Some assumptions here are maybe you have a niche industry-specific problem. Um, maybe a large model is too slow to run on the edge, right? Even, even if you had Clip and Clip could do what you wanted to do, let's return to the nature uh, example. You know those cameras that run, that, uh, that look at like uh, nests and tell you when like a, a bird is hatching in the nest? Those, those models, um, you know, it might be really nice to run the model on the edge. So we don't have to stream all the video up and then process the video with our model. It'd be pretty cool if we could just run the model at the same time where the image is captured. Well, that's going to rely on, you know, we might be compute constrained. We might not be able to deploy A100s to Yellowstone, right? So we might need a, a smaller, more um, efficient um, model. Um, that's where I wrote, you know, we may need to run real time on the edge or on device. We may need, to, we may want to be building our own IP. Um, maybe it's important to us that like we start to be able to factor in our own data, right? Like OpenAI and, and Clip and these models know a lot, which is amazing. But for me, I'm building a product or a service and I'm going to build a data mode. And the way to make use of that data mode is to use that data to train a better model that's more specific to my users and problems. And so that's going to rely on some level of fine tuning or, or retraining. Um, so I, I, I have two types of scenarios here. One is, is species identification, like I mentioned above. Um, and in kind of a quote that, that I want you to think about here is, large models know a lot about a lot. I need a model that knows a lot about a little in my, with my problems context in mind. That's the way to think about this, right? Like Clip can tell you about bald eagles and um, you know Jordans that you wear on your feet um, and aerial images of sharks and manufacturing defect lines. It can tell you about lots and lots of stuff. Um, but maybe you just need to know about a little bit of stuff and you want to mix in some of your own data. Then you're in the world of, of fine tuning or maybe training of your own custom sort of model. One approach here, and this is why I put scenario 2A, one approach here is you can make use of distillation. And if you're unfamiliar, distillation is the approach of taking a large model and um, um, extracting what that large model knows about your context into a much smaller model that you can then take and use. Um, the name is actually quite, the, the name is, is well described, distilling insights into a much smaller uh, understanding and scope of the world. So Auto Distill is an open source project that we built and maintain that I'll show you a little bit about for, for this process. What Auto Distill says is, hey, you've got these large foundation models that know, again, a lot about a lot of things, but you, for your problem, you just need to know about one small slice of the world. So we said, why don't we enable users and developers to pick a large model, which knows a lot about the world. So for example, on this nice here table, uh, maybe I want to use SAM, the segment anything model, plus CLIP, the contrastive language image for training model from OpenAI which between those two models, they will know a lot about the world. They will know about how to segment anything and probably how to describe what's inside that segmentation. And I can, I can um, pass a video or a collection of images to that large model and it will auto-label all of them. It will auto-label everything that it sees and everything that it knows about those images. And then when you have that auto-label data set, you can then train a smaller model. So now I've got my auto-label data set and I can train a smaller model that then becomes mine. The syntax for this is uh, quite simple. So all you do is you import the large model that you want to use. So in this case, grounded SAM. You import the ability to use caption ontology, and you import the smaller model. So in this context, I'm going to use a smaller YOLO model. I declare my base model. So here, I would declare grounded SAM, and I pass some ontology. This ontology means, hey, big model, whatever you see, I want you to refer to it as blank. So in this context, whenever you see a shipping container, just call it container. Then I point my base model to some collection of images or video. 
I declare my target model, which is the smaller model, and then I train. That's it. <laughs> From those, those lines, I'm going to get an auto-labeled data set. I'm going to have a, um, all the annotations ready, and then I'll get a smaller trained model um, that I can use that to predict. And then if you really like um, own a page out of Vercel's book, you can deploy this with some of the tools that we have for deploying stuff. But ultimately, the model is something that you can just take, use, and, and go about your day, uh, use it however you like. Um, so this is one approach that we have for basically saying, I have this large model that knows a lot about a lot, and I want to distill it into a smaller model uh, that is mine I can use. And so you wow. can do this for, go ahead. Can I interrupt you real quick, Joseph? Yeah, yeah. That, yeah, that that's awesome. I, I love that snippet of code. So let's say you do that, right? You train that smaller model and you deploy it. Uh, and you're using it in production. Is there yes. some way you can use the the data that you're getting? Let's say I'm having, I get 100 users a day. Can I use that data to further improve the model in any way? How how does that how does that work? Yes, uh, and that's a very that should be a very top of mind consideration. The way that you uh, handle that is with active learning. So your head's in exactly the right spot. It's like okay, great. I've trained this model to identify specific species of bald eagles. Um, how do I know my model is seeing what I want it to see? And how can I find the places where it's not seen what I expect it to see? And then how can I use when it's not seen what I expect it to see to continue this loop and improve? Um, the way to do this is by, uh, you, can, you can imagine having like a mini, um, almost like a mini logger that's watching what your model sees um, and then sending back images when your model is not doing what you want it to do. So for example, um, uh, let's do a different example. Let's say that I'm counting cars in a parking lot and I'm Walmart. Um, in this context, um, I'm a 24 seven Walmart. I know that there should always be cars in my parking lot. So if I'm running my model and there were zero detections for some of those frames, I immediately know something was wrong because I should have gotten at least one detection. So I could declare that I want, I want to guarantee that there's at least one class here. You see, I, I'm going to here as a series of parameters. I'm going to declare that basically do smart monitoring of the model. I would set required class count to at least one because there should be at least one car in the parking lot. Or for example, maybe I know the bounding box size, like the size of things that I'm seeing should always be above or below some size. Uh, we had a customer that they're a, a oil and gas customer and they have uh, cameras deployed out in the wild across 80 stations in the US looking at their infrastructure. And one time they had a bird fly in front of the camera and it drew like a bounty box like across the entire bird and triggered this, this like false release detection alert. The rule-based method there of knowing that you have a bounty box that is greater than any sort of bounty box size you've seen before immediately says, hey, there's something, there's something up here. And then the third, third uh, common way to do like automated monitoring is actually using what we were talking about earlier with Clip. Since Clip has an embedded understanding of the world, we can say, hey, Clip, how similar is this thing that I'm looking at to this other thing? So if we're in the Walmart parking lot again, and we'll pretend that the camera gets bumped. Now it's pointed towards the street instead of the parking lot. All of a sudden, all the embedded images that we're getting back from that camera look radically different than the images that it was seeing before it got bumped. And so we know, hey, send those images back, or maybe actually the production system is, is, is messed up. Um, so your question is, is super apt and very real world. And you can basically set up these uh, small active learning conditional, as we call them, that allow you to monitor and uh, improve the model. And then of course, this is open source Python package. You can send those images wherever you want to improve the model. Wow, I love that. Thanks for the answer. Yeah. Um, now let's say let's say there's, uh, there, I, I, did, I did two so here. I, I just wanted to ask one thing, that Walmart yeah. example. So yeah. I'm not sure if you followed, but uh, at one point that was a, a trading strategy. Was, is that from, uh, is that what that's from, that example? <laughs> yeah, so it's um, it's the alpha is now gone. Um, totally, but there. Uh, but it's pretty famous actually. At um, it was used at Chipotle's after they had a lot of salmonella outbreaks. Traders wanted to know like is foot traffic back at Chipotle or not, and so they were looking at solid imagery of how many cars were in the Chipotle parking lots to figure out where they're going to beat earnings or not. Um, another one that's like kind of famous in like the hedge fund world is oil tankers that are going along. Um, you look at from a satellite image how big their shadow is and how big their shadow is is how deep in the water they're sitting and how deep in the water they're sitting is how much oil they're carrying like it's pretty it's pretty wild um this is why i work on tools because i don't have the great ideas of what to do with the tools these are like way 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 better uh thoughts and, and processes um so another example where you know 
So we mentioned that we're, we're in scenario two, right? Where we think we have a model that works as is. Um, and we, we, we said, okay, we're going to take a foundation model. And we're going to squeeze everything we know out of it as much as we can. And that could be a multimodal model. That could be Bard. That could be Flamingo. It could be, you know, uh, Sam Clip. It could be any of these. Um, now, let's say that actually I have a, a smaller, maybe use case specific model. So uh, earlier I mentioned RoboFlow Universe, which is a community of, of open source models that users have trained. There's over 50,000 models that users have trained there. Um, one of them that I saw, let me just show you, was this rock, paper, scissors model. Um, and I saw this rock, paper, scissors model, and uh, it can basically, you know, as you expect, uh, you can either call the API and uh, it'll tell you like what's there. So I built this, I was going to a conference and I was like, I can't just have a regular conference booth. That's not fun. And so I made this thing that afternoon that um, is a really simple like rock, paper, scissors versus AI app. And so you'll notice that on page load, you'll see the models already running in browser. So um, RoboFlow.js is a, is a thin wrapper around TensorFlow.js for loading and running custom models. And as you see, I'm on a Zoom call and screen sharing. I'm getting about 31 FPS on my M1, which is pretty good. So what this model does, or what this game does, is it allows me to play rock, paper, scissors against AI. So it goes like a countdown, three, two, one. And let's see. I, I tie. I tie. I bet. No, I, mean, I, I want to beat it. I can't, I can't just go out on a tie. Uh, okay, maybe I can. Uh, okay, I lost. All right, that's fine. That's fine. I wanted you at least to know that, like, I'm not, you know, <laughs> that it doesn't just throw whatever I throw. Okay, I can't beat it. Stick and rock. All right, that's not my day. So the way that this the way that this works um, is um, here. I'll, let me share my whole screen so you can see the code real quick. I said it's versus AI. In fact, when I built this in, in a couple hours, my my current AI, um, uh, my current AI is here. You go. This is my current AI. <laughs> as I do a random choice uh, between rock, paper, and scissors. What I want to do as a next step is I want to hook this up to GPT-4 so you actually play against AI. Um, but the point is there. Now, anyway, the thing that I wanted to show with this model, in fact, is if I go back to it, is I think I have this foundation model, or I think I have this model. It's not a foundation model, it's a small model. And I think I have this model that like works really well. But I noticed that like when you get too far away, it actually doesn't see what I threw. And so there's no, you see there's no game result because it just says what the computer chose, but not what I chose. So this would be, again, a case where I'd want to collect data, retrain my model, and redeploy my model as, as one simple example. Okay, now the third scenario. The third scenario is... Um, I know that a lot, I know that there's not a model that sees what I needed to see, right? So if scenario one is there's a there's a model that already exists and it's going to do perfectly, whether it's a foundation model or a small model that someone has trained from my use case, great. Scenario two is I I think the model is going to work, but it's not going to work all the way. Scenario three is I definitely know there's not a model that exists for the things that I want to do. This is actually a category a lot of our commercial customers and enterprise customers fall into, um, because for example, if you work on a manufacturing line. Um, like our customer Rivian building electric cars. No one else builds Rivians except for Rivian. <laughs> so only Rivian knows what a Rivian is supposed to look like at the time of its production. Um, so this is a case that's that's quite common. And common models in this context actually are often smaller models like ResNets, Yolo models, efficient nets, provision transformer, which is actually fairly big, all things considered, but not nearly the size of some of these other models we were talking about. Common uses for training your own thing altogether is. I mentioned identifying machine parts, seeing things from unconventional angles, running a mobile app in browser, uh, running a mobile app fully client side, like I just did in, in the, the example I showed there, um, where that model loads on page load. So common assumptions here is I maybe want to distill something big into something small again. Maybe I have data of a specific thing. Maybe a small model I want to deploy to the edge or limited compute. Maybe I want to create something that I own and use. Um, so a scenario here that uh, might make sense is um, a lot of commercial use cases, certainly, where customers have data that no one else has, definitionally, because it's proprietary. But also, like, um, actually, chess piece detectors comes up a lot, because <laughs> a lot of developers also play chess, and so they end up building these chess piece detectors. And so a lot of chess pieces look custom, and they look different. Um, my chess, my, and, and the, the angle by which you capture the chess set also matters. Um, and so, you know, I actually might need to build a custom chess piece detector. Um, now, again, building a custom model doesn't mean I start totally from zero, right? I can still make use of what foundation models know and what they see. But generally speaking, and on the slide scale of like, I don't need to change anything about the data to I need to change some of the data. This is changing um, more of the data in general. So this is kind of scenario three. And again, as I mentioned, we can go deeper into any one of these scenarios.
Um, so last things, last things last, uh, Robophobia have tools to make each of this process easier uh, from data sets of improved labeling and QA workflows and smart collection and filtering to model training, um, hosted model training or open source model training to deploying. I showed some of the deployed places, both in browser, a container you can take and run inside your own service, uh, any of these sorts of things. But we exist as the developer infrastructure to deliver state-of-the-art models, data set tools and deployments so that teams can make incredible things much more quickly. Um, and the best place probably to poke around is kind of what I showed earlier, Rebelflow Universe, because you'll just find so much inspiration from the 200,000 projects, 150 million labeled images and 50,000 pre-trained uh, data sets. So with that, um, that's that's kind of what I had for the the opener. Um, I guess I went a little bit uh, a little bit long, but I guess there's some good discussion in there. Happy, of course, to yield for for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Joseph. That was amazing. Um, we'll take some questions uh, from the crowd. I saw Eric uh, raise his hand, so I'm going to hand over the mic to him in a second. But in the meantime, uh, for those that want to stick around after the Q and A, uh, Joseph can dive into one of those three scenarios that we talked about, right? Either using an existing model fully, like the semantic search that we saw, using an existing model partially, uh, or building your own model. So if you're uh, planning on sticking around for a little bit uh, for Joseph to deep dive, please vote. We have an active poll. And with that in mind, Eric, please uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah. Um, so a lot of this stuff is super fun and it is incredibly easy to spend a ton of time churning on models. Um, where do you typically start? It, sound, it sounded like you, your advice is typically not to start with assuming a foundation model will do it for you. Um, like, yeah. What do, what do you typically tell people who are getting started? The truth is the data set quality is still the eat your vegetables of machine learning. It's like the thing that's not super interesting, not super fun to work on, um, but the thing that's going to make your model much stronger. Uh, it's going to grow up to be big and strong if it has uh, really thoughtful curation. Um, the segment anything model that I alluded to earlier um, is a great example of this. So segment anything is a model that Thayer released a couple of months ago that does a really good job of zero shot segmentation, meaning like drawing masks around anything in the scene that you can see. And what's notable about that model is um, certainly like it, it scaled up compute and notably, but what it really did was they just were really, really deliberate in their data set curation. Their data set is 11 million images and 1.1 billion masks. And they basically just did the, they dialed up the data set size much larger than anything else. And interestingly, the way they built the data set is they first labeled everything from scratch. Then they trained the model and used that to label more of the data set. And they kind of did this back and forth, like human in the loop foundation model, uh, preparation until they were able to basically automate data set generation. Um, so the thing that I see people getting tripped up with actually a lot of the time is almost thinking that um, uh, approaching things with a bit more of like a waterfall mindset rather than like an agile mindset, right? Like if you have, um, it's not, a lot of people think there's still, it feels like this open secret in machine learning and computer vision is that um, you actually need a lot less data than you think to get started. Um, and in fact, with a foundation model, you might not need any custom data that you think to get started. Um, so I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that people spend uh, way too much time uh, on any one step before testing and de-risking and um, giving people or giving a, giving your model a chance to, to work. So I think the uh, in terms of like foundation model selection versus custom model selection, I try to give an overview of that in my slides, right? If your thing is like generally known and would show up on the internet uh, with a large data set, then maybe a foundation model has has good representation of it. But if it doesn't, it's kind of no harm, no foul to like, when, we, when I talk about the context of labeling or prepping a data set, it's like a few hundred images is all, would, uh, is all what it would take to train an initial model to see if the idea can be de-risked. Um, and usually getting your thing into production so that you even if it's in like production in shadow mode, so to speak, like it's running in the background and collecting more data, like the Walmart parking lot example, pretend you're in a world where you just have someone counting, a human counting how many cars are in the parking lot. Initially you deploy a model and you just have it making counts the best that it can. You'll have like a calibration period, maybe two or four weeks uh, where you um, uh, improve the model performance and improve the data set and then, and then deploy. So long story short, um, being agile and starting with a, a small data set training a small model, allowing it to hit production, and then getting the data fly loop going is certainly the uh, the key that we see between projects that make it to production quickly and, and those that kind of stymie. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, if anybody else has any questions, feel free to, to raise your hand uh, or drop questions in the chat. And if not, we can let Joseph dive into scenario number two, because it looks like that's the one that won. Awesome. So scenario two is use an existing model partially, uh, like speech identification or, or something like this. Um, this is actually a good one to dive into because we kind of get to touch both sides of, of things, right? Like both the foundation model utilization, as well as uh, training a custom model. Let me pull. Okay. So in the scenario where we're gonna um, where we're gonna use like a foundation model initially, and then we're gonna see where it fails, and then we're going to improve it. Um, a moment ago in the, in the talk, I actually think that um, I had the chance to go through in a bit of depth the semantic search uh, example, I guess, like um, block list level depth. Um, what I can do here is I'll share a couple of different um, a couple of different resources from the get go, and then I'll describe what happens when the model fails. So let's say that we're starting starting with the foundation model, and I'm just putting some links in the chat um, with OpenAI's clip. And then I also have a Python version of that. Um, so I put those two links in the chat. So let's pretend that you have, um, share my screen again. Let's pretend that you are building a um, semantic search and retrieval or a content filtering system. Um, so we're building, basically, we're building a classification model. The model is gonna apply tags at the image level to what it's seeing. It doesn't know where those things are necessarily. It doesn't necessarily know how many there are. Uh, but it knows the presence of something, like the presence of, of a given species or um, a given, given attribute. Um, now, as noted, the approach that we're going to take is uh, we'll take whatever data we have. Um, and actually, the how we built paint.wtf post is going to be really useful here. And we'll pull that one up as a walkthrough. So, yeah, here we go. So I wrote this blog post a couple years ago when we built paint.wtf. So let me talk through this in, in great in great depth of, of what's going on here. Um, so paint.wtf, again, is a, is a game that provides users with a prompt. Um, users draw on a Microsoft Paint-like interface, and then an AI model, in this case Clip, ranks the similarity of how close the user's drawing was to the perceived text prompt. So the way that this was built, um, the this was, I forget what the open source library we use, literally Canvas, we linked to it. Um, for building Microsoft Paint-like uh, functionality in the browser. But I want to talk about kind of the machine learning side. So how does this actually work? The way that it works is when you have a given image, actually, before I describe how this works, let me give some context into Clip, um, just so we're all on the same playing field. Clip is Contrastive Language Image for Training. It's a model that OpenAI released in January 2021. And what was novel about it is it trained on 400 million image text pairs. So you can think about it like images and Instagram captions. And so in this embedding space, you know, previously when we were trained classification models, we would need to say, um, you know, once one, it was very, uh, it was what's called closed set. You know, you just had one class prescribed to a given image, like dog, cat, chair, you name it. What Clip did is it opened up the aperture to be what's called open set. Because when you have a caption, you know, that caption describes the image in an open form way. And so when Clip embedded those 400 million image text pairs into its embedding space, it created this um, multimodal link of what sort of word attributes, what words, what word embeddings correspond to what image embeddings. And so this creates a way for us to translate between word and image embeddings. And so ultimately when we use Clip, all we're going to do is we're gonna translate every, every piece of content that we get we're gonna translate it into Clip's feature space. We're gonna embed it, basically, you can think about it almost like Rosetta Stone, embed it into the way that Clip thinks about that image and the way that Clip thinks about that text. And whatever is, in this case, closest is what we would return to the user for search. So um, yeah, that was kind of the observations here. So, I mean, the way we built a service on top of this is kind of what I mentioned earlier is, well, what we need to do is we need to get the embedding for the image because we need to embed the image in Clip's feature space. So that's what we're calling here is the embed endpoint. Um, then we need to uh, save that embedding. And as I mentioned, this, this post just makes use of using PG vector uh, in Superbase. And so we're gonna save that embedding. And in this context, the embedding is a 512 int, which is how many dimensions represent the image. Um, we're gonna add all those images uh, into Superbase, into our database that we just set up. 
Now, okay, great. We've got a bunch of images and their embeddings in Supabase. Now we want to search against those images that we have in our database. So we set up the search function. Uh, and what this does is it takes the query embedding, which is what the user's text query is going to be. And then it takes some match threshold, which the user can define if they want, or they can yield to the, the default, which we set to be relatively low. Uh, and it can specify how many matches there are. So what we're going to do is um, above is where we make our actual search. So here's kind of the magical line where we have the images embedding, we're gonna do cosine similarity, which is denoted by this, of the query embedding. And whatever is most similar here is what we're gonna return, um, as long as it's above the match threshold, because we limit it to some number of user matches. So it's actually relatively straightforward. You have a bunch of images, you embed those images, you then have a 512 int array that represents that image. You then have some text you, as a query, you embed that text, and then you say, okay, great. I've got this embedding text, this embedding image. What is What image records are most similar? Cosine, cosine closeness to this 512 embedded query. Return N, where N is the number of, of matches to the user. Um, now, okay, so that's like, that's that's the happy path. That's assuming that works everything as is. Now, the question is like, okay, what if that starts failing? Uh, what if that starts to not work uh, particularly well? Um, then we would start to do some observations and as honest, I acknowledge I saw your note here too. Then we would start to do some, um, we would do some monitoring of where the model is, is working or failing, like Hassan and I were talking about earlier of, hey, we're seeing that the embeddings and the results are, are much poorer. And that will, we would start to collect our own custom data. And once we have our own custom data, then we would probably start to do some of our own labeling of that custom data. Um, so I guess I can show a quick, um, quick example of, okay, if we have custom data, we have it embedded. Um, here's my, uh, my Rick, Rick detector. So I've got a bunch of these images of, of Rick in this context. I'm like, okay, great. I need to do some of my own custom labeling. So here I'll make use of segment anything as noted, which allows you to segment any interface. So you can see that's what, these are the masks that segment anything is predicting zero shot. So I'll just say that this is, this is Rick. That's definitely Rick. This. That's definitely not Rick. And I would do this a few times uh, to begin to collect my own sort of data set of what is Rick and what isn't Rick. Um, and actually, I'd want to be consistent with my, my labeling. If I'm labeling the whole person or if I'm just labeling their face, um, maybe I'll label the whole head, something like this. That's not Rick. Uh, and then once I have a, a, no, a number of images of my subjects of interest, um, I can go ahead and train a new model. And then you saw me, I have this model that I can deploy this model. I can use it in my webcam. I can use it via API, however I want and continue this process of monitoring my model, seeing where it fails, improving the data set, retraining and going about the way. All right, thanks again, Joseph. Thanks everybody for coming and uh, have a great rest of your night. Thanks so much for having me.